say to me, that was the scariest movie I, I've ever seen. Who is that? I think the fascination with ghost stories is that we love to be scared. It's easy to get into spooky stuff. It's just as natural as breathing. It was a revenge story. There's something more frightening to me in some ways when you can't personify evil. Stay away from the fog. Who's there? The only, the classic, Halloween. I remember Halloween being the most frightening film I had ever seen. And I think the reason it was terrifying is because the audience was always, they were with the killer. They knew what was coming, and so you were waiting. You were just on the edge of your seat. It was an amazing first time. We were kids. I wrote it for free. John wrote it for free. I produced it for free. John directed it for free. I mean, it was a labor of love. Halloween came out and it didn't get very good reviews. It kind of got, everybody said it wasn't very scary, it's a turkey, blah, blah. And, we, and I thought, Deborah called me when I was shooting Elvis in Nashville. We were on location, she said, and this one didn't work. So I had kind of written it off and then weeks later, a month later maybe, Bob Ramey from Abco Embassy came to pay a visit on the set and wanted to do a two picture deal with me over there. And based on the success of Halloween, I didn't know what anybody was talking about. What is everybody talking about? What success? I thought we bombed. Halloween got re-reviewed uh, by the Village Voice. It was kind of a very positive review. And uh, all of a sudden, not only was the movie making money, but uh, I was a sort of uh, second-rate uh, tin pot uh, Hitchcock, which was absolutely not true, but that's what they were saying. Halloween became this independent filmmaking phenomenon. Halloween until Blair Witch Project came out, was the most successful independent film in history. It cost $320,000 to make and grossed uh, $55 million. Halloween gave John and myself credibility immediately. Um, it became a cult classic immediately. John and Deborah just lit up like a firecracker. They just became hot as they could be. They delivered this home run right out of the park with Halloween. And so everybody wanted a piece of that. Everybody wanted to be a part of that and see what they come up with next. They definitely wanted to follow it up with another scary movie, you know, to sort of plow that same field. I think they wanted to be sure that it was a very visual and a little more, uh, I guess you might say classy, uh, type of project. I don't think they wanted to do another knife picture. And they hit upon the notion of a real old-fashioned ghost story. It's not like John and I said, let's go do a ghost story. We happened to be in Stonehenge. We were over in England, and we took a trek down Stonehenge. Out in the distance, pulsating in the fields and in the bogs out there, was this fog bank. And it was just, it was pulsating as if there was something in it. And John said, what do you think's in that, you know, in that fog? It was a very overcast, kind of a typical British day. And there was a fog uh, bank sitting out there. And it just seemed like a great, eerie, uh, kind of situation. And then when we started writing it, you know, we went back to the old thing of revenge. I think ghosts exist because there's something about their death that keeps them going and keeps them sort of in an altered universe and most of the time they come back for revenge. Well for me the fog really goes back to uh, a comic book series that, that I loved back in the 50s called EC Comics. Tales from the Crypt, The Vault of Horror, and they always had these uh, rotting corpses rising up and getting revenge on somebody. Well, there's a real story that took place in Goleta, California. It's a, I don't know, it's a 17, 1800s. Uh, literally, it's the, it's the fog. They were bringing in uh, gold, and they put bonfires out on the beach to bring the ships in. By the town, hijacked it. The ship crashed, they took the gold. I mean, that's out of history. And it was a great trick you know, lure people to their deaths, and I thought, what a great revenge story. Blake followed our false fire on shore, and his ship broke apart on the rocks off Spivey Point. We were aided by an unearthly fog that rolled in as if heaven sent.
you know, while Halloween was about evil, um, even though there were evil aspects of the fog, the fog was much more supernatural. And I think what we try to do in Halloween is we try to explain evil in a human as opposed to the revenge in, in ghosts. And so there are very, very different themes to the films. And so therefore, because they're different themes, they have to look different and they have to be shot differently. And um, they were stylized in very, very different ways. We're not building you up the same way as we did in Halloween. We're not trying to, to get you to, to be frightened of the same things. It's, it's somewhat different. We were probably drawing on a lot of the classic uh, sort of ghost stories as opposed to uh, horror and, and slasher. I think The Fog was very sort of literate in that sense, didn't rely on the usual scares. Edgar Allan Poe was my favorite author growing up. Edgar Allan Poe is certainly a classic example of taking the unknown and, uh, and creating the sense of terror and, and uh, unsettling feeling around it. I think the idea of, of a faceless kind of amorphous evil uh, that we can't fight was, was terrifying. You know, it's something beyond us. It, it, again, it goes to Lovecraft. There's some force that's coming to get us. Well, Lovecraft's always talking about something from beyond, something out there. There's some either a god or a force or a creature that's used to be in control here and is now trying to take back control and is waiting to somehow revisit us once again. It's going away. There's an emphasis in the fog on an ensemble cast. I knew I wanted to do something with Jamie again. It'll probably take me a month to get to Vancouver and if I can sell them for five bucks a piece, I'll be rich. In a horror film, you, you start out usually very normal, like a normal person, and you end up being a terrorized individual. <laughs> So you have all this range to play. You go from sad to happy, crying, hysterical. Your smarts come back in, determination, bravery, and all those things come into a horror film if you're the person who inevitably gets terrorized. I had worked with uh, Adrienne Barbeau on uh, Someone's Watching Me. She and I had been married, and I wanted to cast her in it. I'm not so sure I want you. You're just a voice on the phone. I think you'll see in all of John's films that he is attracted to strong women characters and I know he's said in other interviews that he's a, a huge fan of Howard Hawks and the Hawksian woman and so he wrote a heroine he wrote a strong woman well that's what I get for owning a station and if you don't tell me why you call in about 15 seconds I'm gonna have to hang up on you she's not being saved by someone else she's doing the saving Andy Andy get out of the house Mrs. Cobra get him out of the house please run I became a John Carpenter fan when I saw uh, a screening of Halloween. After the screening, I was very impressed. And I told him, I said, if you ever have uh, a role for a middle-aged actress, I would love to be in your movie, because I really admire your work. I've always been a fan of, of Janet Lee. I think you're taking all of this much too seriously. I was a fan, of, especially of Janet Lee and uh, the Vikings. It was one of my favorite old Viking movies. Here was an opportunity where we wrote this character who was kind of like the mayor of this town. All of us living here in Antonio Bay today owe a great debt of gratitude to those men and women a hundred years ago. And why not cast Janet Lee, my hero from Psycho, and just some incredible films. And we knew her phone number, uh, so we called her and asked her to do it, and, and, and she did a great job. It's funny, but all I can think about is my silly dog barking all night and my mom and I don't really work together in this film which I must tell you I prefer it because it's very easy to put us together as a mother daughter and make it a package deal in quite a few films and we've been offered little parts here and there mother and daughter I would much rather work with her maybe in a film but I'd rather save that one time that we work together for a really terrific project our celebration tonight is a travesty we're honoring murderers for the priest, I think we needed to have somebody who was very sober in terms of his realization that he had kept the secret and he'd hidden it from everybody. And so I think Hal Holbrook is a brilliant character. He's Mark Twain. And I think to have Mark Twain have that evil side to him, that sort of negative side to him, for me, was very exciting. But it does not soothe the horror that I feel being an accomplice to murder. He was really scary. And um, my responses were 
I mean, it was for real. Jesus! Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Mrs. Williams. 11.55. Almost midnight. The interesting thing about shooting John Hausman was that we shot that scene, which is around a campfire on a soundstage. My God, it was a fire burning on the shore. We set up this sort of fake little campfire, brought John Hausman in for a day. We're in our 20s, our late 20s. We're filmmakers. We're on our second film. And he was such a gentleman. And he's from the old school. And he validated, in many ways, the process that we were making the movie The Fog. Shit. I'm sorry. Cut. John has a very dark side. There is, you know, that duality in John that I think is thematic in every film he ever does. Evidence of deep penetrating wounds in each ocular orbit entering into the cranial cavity. John is a, a storyteller using visuals. His great strength when I began working with him was the revelation that he really cared about the camera and the storytelling with that. John's filmmaking is a study in how to keep it simple. He doesn't allow the tendency that many filmmakers have to indulge themselves or get involved in a fancy shot or pile it on like no other filmmaker I know he really focuses in on what's the point at a given moment what am I doing here am I about to scare somebody am I trying to convey tenderness in this moment he really tries to keep it quite simple I think it's a great secret I think the primary reason I'm making movies is to get a response from the audience, is to get the audience to go with me down whatever path I'm trying to take them, whether it's to make them laugh or to thrill them or just make them jump. Hello? The Fog was the second movie I'd made with Dean Cundy, who's a, you know, a brilliant photographer. I mean, he's one of the greatest of all time. I had been doing a lot of low-budget films with um, a lot of directors and they usually involved uh, actions and car chases and girls with machine guns you know they was the projector fodder of the period uh, when they were still driving theaters and working with John was uh, to me a great sort of revelation about how you could actually make films that were low budget but still had a great deal of sort of style and, and thought that went into them each shot, each sequence should involve, uh, you know, the storytelling moment or creating an emotional response. Using uh, everything that the film uh, process allows you to use, which is, of course, visuals, uh, music, sound effects, editing, all of that style that is important in film. With a slightly larger budget, we were able to build sets. And most of the low-budget films I'd been doing previously, we, we were always limited to shooting in locations, which was, for me, a great uh, training in how do you work in small spaces, real, real locations and so forth, and make them look like something. It was a great experience to, to take the lighthouse, for instance, and instead of having to shoot so high off the ground as the, the real lighthouse was, to actually have it on a stage and be able to control the lighting and to create uh, the, the moving light that we needed at night to be part of the mood and the, and the style of it, which would have been impossible, perhaps, um, had we been shooting in a real lighthouse. I think the use of the anamorphic panel vision widescreen format is something that John really insisted on. And when you have very, very little money and you're composing for this huge widescreen, it actually looks like you have a bigger-than-life movie. And I think also, too, with the ensemble nature of the fog, it was really great because you can compose multiple heads. The 235 aspect ratio, the anamorphic ratio, to me is, is always one of the most interesting. Once in a while it's a handicap, but most of the time when people complain, well, it's, the film is this, it's so wide you can't shoot a close-up in it, what they're not doing is figuring out how to use the rest of the frame to help tell the story. You can do things to shoot a close-up in anamorphic and yet 
still uh, embellish the frame with either other aspects of the, uh, the location, the set or whatever in, in the side of the frame. It's more how we see as people. We were able to go and shoot, for instance, the lighthouse on the cliff and really create the loneliness uh, of feeling about it. It wasn't about just a lighthouse in the middle of the frame, but also about the scenery and the California coastline where we were working. Parker! We shot the movie in uh, Inverness, California, Point Reyes National Seashore. How we found this lighthouse is we went for a trip starting here in Los Angeles, driving up the coast, stopping at every single lighthouse that we saw in California. And when we got to Point Reyes and we saw this location, and it was the second foggiest point in the United States with Nantucket being the first, I mean, it was just an amazing location. It was difficult to shoot. It was unique. It wasn't that sort of tall, phallic-looking lighthouse that we're all familiar with. And it just lent itself to the movie. Because we decided to shoot in this location, the movie itself was less claustrophobic than I think Halloween was. You know, we had a lot more daylight in the fog. Um, there was the ocean. There was all kinds of fun things in it that we didn't have in, in the first film that we did. To get there, you have to walk down 365 steps or some, I don't remember the exact amount, but they were a lot. And then you had to walk back up, and it wasn't so hard for the actors, but the poor crew carrying the cameras and everything. And if it was too windy, then they closed the whole thing down. It was a national park. When we talked about the fog, we wanted it to be sort of a character and how to create it, giving it a sense of life, um, giving it um, the ability to move sort of consciously. It's almost like a wall across the east end of town. It had to be sinister and contain an evil force. On set, or, or around the actors, or coming down the street, you have, you have what are foggers. I mean, these big machines, and they, they put out all this fog. And I asked our effects guy, Dick Albain, what's your secret ingredient? He says, it's called fog juice. And if you've ever played around a movie set and watched the special effects guys doing their fog machines, either the great big ones or the little bitty foofers, it's just sort of <laughs> And it goes like that, and it goes away. So try controlling that. What they needed to do in that scene is that I was surrounded by fog, and suddenly the fog disappears. But they could blow the fog in, but they couldn't get it out. So John came to me, and he said, look, we have to act this scene in reverse, and then I'm going to print it backwards. And he said, the one thing you have to do, aside from getting all the emotions in reverse, is you have to be careful when you blink. Because blinking shows up on camera. When we do this technique, it'll look weird. We needed wide shots that showed the fog consciously moving through town and around buildings and down streets and so forth. We developed a, a technique where we would photograph the city streets and the wide shots of the town. And then we would, on a stage completely blacked in, we would build a black um, sort of form or shape that replicated the buildings. And then we would photograph the stage uh, backlit with, with light to bring out the fog that we would then shoot in. And we would use uh, carbon dioxide fog, uh, dry ice essentially, so that it was very low and dense and would creep. And it would move around these black shapes and that corresponded to the buildings that we had photographed previously. So what we got was a fog that would react to these large buildings, but move in a flowing motion, seemingly with purpose. I remember we were in the editing room. I had gone on a holiday, and I came back from Tahiti, and Charles Bornstein and Tommy Lee Wallace were in there, and, and they had been cutting away. I said, how's it going, guys? And they had these grim faces, and I realized, ooh, I think we're in trouble. I didn't have a great feeling about it. I thought that we'd done okay. And John had put, you know, some nice music to it. But it was still, hmm. We'd done a final mix and I watched the movie and I realized, this doesn't work. There's something wrong here. We, ugh, this doesn't work. It's really getting late. Uh, there's not much we can do. 
we can do about any of this. After we showed the picture to Bob Remy and the AFCO embassy team, they felt that it really wasn't quite scary enough. They didn't react um, with the, the amount of um, terror that we had hoped. It sucked. It was terrible. And it didn't have an impact, you know, it was, it was, uh, this wasn't any good. And it was, a, that's a tough time. That was the first time as a filmmaker I had to face that uh, situation. And I thought, you know, hey, you can go cry or you can stand up and be a pro and let's go fix this baby. Let's go get it right. Let's get it better. Let's make it scarier. Let's make it moodier. For a moment, they could see nothing, not a foot ahead of them. And then they saw a light felt like we needed to go back in and emphasize certain things that would make it, would raise the stakes in terms of the horror and the terror. There needed to be more. There needed to be the obvious uh, threat of life. Yeah! And that began this madcap process because we were actually not too far from the release date. We'd used up most of our cutting time. And so we sat down and realized we have to go back to work on this. And it was quite something else. And we uh, tore it apart, put it back together again, did some reshoots, did some fixes. I redid some music, redid sound effects in a very, very short time and made our release. So we ended up going back and reshooting and put in more ghosts, more obvious ghosts. If it's extremely close, detail shot in the movie, it was probably shot late in the game. If it's, if it's like a Rawr! kind of shot. The opening montage of the, of the poltergeist activity in town, the car lights, all this opening was, was created out of nothing. A Buck Flower and a John Goff are on their boat and they get killed in the fog by these killer ghosts. That was built and shot. Afterwards, we shot the uh, interior of the boat where Tom Atkins tells this story. And he unzipped the pocket to give me the coin. It was gone. We had a scare that didn't work. We just had a terrible, terrible scene on a boat. So we, we fixed it. I think I'll go to Vancouver now. I added a character in the morgue where the guy sits up. That was all after. <laughs> and the biggest was the top of the lighthouse. Our uh, North by Northwest climbing on Mount Rushmore sequence when Adrienne goes up to the top and the ghost is behind her. That was not in the original. So you, you were talking about a lot of uh, mood, uh, fear, scary scenes, uh, just better done. David Cronenberg had just come out with the movie Scanners. And the Scanners was, um, was really quite graphic. And there was more gore in Scanners than we had in The Fog. I mean, John and I are always sort of big fans of things that, that you, what you don't see is actually scarier than what you do see. Um, but the idea was that the audiences were getting, you know, they wanted to see more guts, they wanted to see more gore. We put in shots of uh, meat hooks and, 